Hi, I'm Jeff Farnwald, Director of the MBA Program at Rockford College. About 18 months ago, the Rockford Chamber of Commerce set out to make networking easier in Rockford by identifying area people you should know in business. Currently, 41 people have been recognized and celebrated as one of these people. This series of talks held at Rockford College was designed to provide a vehicle for the public to hear from and learn about each of the people you should know. I hope you enjoy this talk. Started. If you all wouldn't mind turning off or silencing your cell phones. And if you bought a sandwich at the cafeteria out there, please open it now. It is a little noisy. <laughs> um, and welcome to Rockford College for our People You Should Know talk. I am eager today to introduce Rebecca Epperson, president of PR Etc. and a 2012 People You Should Know award recipient. PR Etc. is the only firm in Rockford that specializes in public relations but has also expanded in the forms of marketing and event planning. In 2012, PR Etc. was awarded the Heart of Rockford by the River District Association for Commercial Renovation. Rebecca Epperson is heavily involved in the Rockford community, serving as chair for the Women's Leadership Council of the United Way of Rock River Valley, and sitting on many other boards, including YWCA of Rockford, Discovery Center Museum, and the Literacy Council. Her talk today is titled, Top 10 Marketing Activities You Can Implement That Will Make a Difference. Please help me welcome Rebecca Opperson. And she said to stay behind here, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can, so I'll try though. <laughs> well, welcome, thank you for coming out today. Um, I'm excited, you know, one of the things that people ask me a lot is like, what should we do? If we don't have a lot of money, what are the top things we should do? And so we've been asked a question so many times that we kind of just put it into a format of like, here's some ideas, and I'll be the first one to say that there are no like magic bullets, there's no magic wand of what, because every organization is different overall. Um, but I'll give you some ideas and maybe you can take them back to your own organization and make them your own, or maybe it'll at least provide some thought process overall for your organization. So we'll just go with the top 10. Just my five second overview on PR, et cetera. Um, we're based here in Rockford. We will always be based here in Rockford. People ask us that a lot if we're gonna move and we are not. Um, but we do have offices in Madison and Racine. Um, and if you haven't been to Racine, it is a long haul. It's much easier to go to Madison. Um, <laughs> but we have expertise and we have four divisions at PR, et cetera. As Alarna mentioned, we started out in public relations. I have about 27 years experience in just pure public relations. But over the course of the last 12 years, we've expanded into marketing as well as now we have a social media division, division and event planning and implementation. So it kind of runs the, the gambit of everything we do. Um, and then we also, we're very blessed, we have local clients, a lot of local clients, um, regional and, and national and a couple international clients as well, so we're fortunate that way. And um, we also represent several different industries. We have one rule of thumb in our organization is that we cannot um, represent competing organizations. So if we represent one bank, we can't represent another. If we represent one wealth management firm, we can't represent another. Um, and one insurance company, not another, to make sure that we are fully focused on that organization. Because when the media call us and they say, hey, we need to talk to somebody about this issue in insurance, I don't wanna have to make that decision of which client I'm gonna call. We're gonna have one to call um, and we're gonna get them on the news. So those are some of the areas that we work with as well. So I thought we'd just kind of lay the groundwork a little bit on what is marketing communications because I think everybody thinks of it a little bit differently. I know that when we're talking to clients, I had a meeting with a potential new client a couple weeks ago and he's like, well, you do our sales. I'm like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> we do not do sales. Um, we will get people to your door to make the sale, but we're, we will not do the sell for you. We'll make you look good. We'll have the perception being positive. We'll help with any crisis management if you have it. And we help, you know, spread the word. But your job as the company is to do the sales part of it. So we get that question a lot. And so for the purpose of this, and so we're all on the same page for this presentation today, it's really gaining exposure to your key audiences. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard this, but people will say, oh, we market to everybody. Well, I'm sorry, nobody markets to everybody. Even McDonald's, as big as they are, do not market to everybody. They are you know, people that are on the go, that don't mind getting a few more calories, um, and it, just enjoy the experience of maybe getting a happy meal for their kids so they'll be quiet for a couple hours in the car. But they're not gaining exposure to absolutely everybody. So really in gaining that exposure, it's to inform. Sometimes you just want people to let people know and potential audience members to know um, and potential clients that here, this is who you are. We're just informing you on this is what our company is, this is what our organization is about, and just purely informative or branding. 
persuading. Sometimes you want to take them from, okay, now we've informed them that this is our company. Maybe we are a landscape company. Um, and you need to know that we're out there, but now we need to persuade you that either one, you need our services and you don't want to do this every weekend. I'm trying to convince my husband that we don't have to do it every weekend. I'm not good at persuasion yet, um, but uh, we're going to get there this summer, believe me. Um, but persuading people that either using your services now that they know about you, they've been informed about you, or persuading potentially, it's fact is a fact, business is business, to use your organization versus somebody else's. Um, making that choice. Reminding people. Sometimes, you know, you may get contact, constant contact emails or email blasts or something in the mail that you're like, well, this is not something I'm really interested in right now, but when you need to buy that product or service, um, you need to be reminded that they're out there. So we're firm believers of, at our, at our firm, of integrated marketing. So hitting them several different times in several different ways, whether it be through public relations in the media, whether it be advertising, whether it be social media, whether it be sponsorships, and we'll go through a couple of ideas, um, but just reminding them that you're out there. Um, I'll give an example, a couple, I was kind of looking for a new car, and um, you know, I knew I was probably gonna have to look at one this summer, it was getting to that point, and do you ever notice when you're looking for something, you see it everywhere, and you're like, oh, that's a, that's a neat car, oh, that's kind of cool. And so, I, where I was not looking at the car ads anymore, I wasn't looking at the flyers, I wasn't even looking at who in our community sold cars, um, I suddenly was really attached to the idea. So I was reminded based on customer service and what they offered and the sale prices um, when I needed to buy one, which I recently did, um, of who I needed to go to for that. And then finally, dif differentiate. How do you differentiate your company or your organization from others in the community, in the region, in the industry, whichever market you, you sell to. So it's a little bit different than persuade because you have to just tell them a little bit, um, tell them a little bit more about yourself of how your company, your organization is different, better, um, in what category. You might be higher from a cost perspective, but you know some people are willing to pay more for cost if your customer service rocks. So what are you gonna differentiate yourself? You can't differentiate yourself on absolutely everything. In my firm, for example, um, we um, don't do graphic design. Uh, we outsource that because there are some fabulous graphic designers in this community, but that's not our differentiator at all. Our, we differentiate on our integrated marketing as well as our public relations and our social media activities. So just so we're on the same page there. So here's our top 10. One, know thyself. And I know it sounds really simple, and if you're the owner of your company, you're like, well, this is what we started on, this is who we are, this is who we're gonna be. You have it all ingrained. Suddenly you have five employees and now there's 10, now there's 15, now there's 20, now there's another office, now there's um, other vendors that are talking about you out there. How do they know who you are? So getting down your message is a really key thing. It sounds really foundational, but it can't be more important than having everybody in your organization know what your message is and what your company stands for. And it goes back to that informing, persuading, if you can say, at a golf outing, at the chamber golf outing, and you're sitting with somebody in, on the golf course, and you can say, well, oh yeah, we use these guys because they have really good pricing. Well, that's fantastic, they do have good pricing, but you know what, ours is a little bit more expensive, but here are the four other things that differentiate us from that competition. So know thyself and know your message. And then also, um, you know, elevator pitches get good and bad reviews sometimes, but we are firm believers at, about an elevator pitch. What is your message? How do you discreetly and subtly um, and succinctly describe yourself. Because you ever been at a chamber event where you're like, oh, what do you do? And they start glazing over because you spent 15 minutes talking about yourself and you still have no idea what they've done. Um, and you hope that somebody's gonna come in and interrupt you so you can go and get a sandwich somewhere else. It's not that I have done that, I'm just saying, it perhaps <laughs> has happened. But know thyself and know what your elevator pitch is. Um, the second thing, just as important, and we've talked about it briefly, is training your team. Um, you again may know it because you've started the business or you've been with the business a long time or may maybe you're fairly new to the business so you've really ingrained the message into you, but make sure the people around you know what the message is because think of this, you're all sitting here today and you've learned a little bit about here, et cetera. Perhaps you go to a board meeting of what one of my team members is sitting on the board and they describe here, et cetera, a little bit differently. Then you go to a chamber after hours event and you see another one of my team members and they describe the company differently than that. And then you may go somewhere else. You're on a golf course, you're on a plane, and somebody else describes the company. Suddenly you have four or five descriptions of what the company is, and again, you're totally confused on what they are, who they are, 
what they do. So take the time to train your team. Um, we do this about um, every six months, and it's not like a hard and fast rule, but we usually do it when we bring new people in. Um, one, to make sure the what we call the old guard um, has the messaging down. Has anything changed since then? And then how do we make sure that the new people are taking the message out? Because it's not just you sitting in the room taking the message out. It's also the, when you talk to your vendors, suddenly they're gonna explain your company and you wanna make sure it's very succinct and very much the same as well. Number three, know your audience. Um, we described that a little bit earlier, but you can't be everything to everybody. So identify your top tier people that you really are gonna, we call low hanging fruit. Who's our low hanging fruit that we should really be in front of? Um, I'll use the chamber as an example. We're huge supporters of the chamber because we do B2B. A lot of, we do some B2, B2C, um, but we like to network with business professionals and that's how we, in most of our businesses, referral. So we know that this kind of audience is a big one for us. In other cases, um, it might be um, stay-at-home moms. How do you reach them? It might be uh, we're representing and working with a um, assisted living center right now. Um, my audience, although the, the, the users are older, they're not my audience. My audience are the people that are going to help make the decision for their parents, which are usually in their 50s, maybe the 60s. Um, so who is your audience and who you're trying to reach is important. Identify that and um, kind of, we, we top tier one, two, and three of who we go after. Research the media, and this goes right into um, really more the public or media relations aspect of things. Um, it sounds really easy, um, but we look at, when we go into a new market, for example, if there's a client in a new market, we'll download probably 10 days worth of morning newscasts to see what they're talking about. Is somebody got a dog? Is somebody big into a certain issue? Do they support cancer? Um, do they, are they, um, do they have children? Um, are they a foodie? So we look at the media in each market. And then we also um, usually order about a month's worth of paper. So we get these, UPS man loves us, um, stack of papers from whatever market we're in. And we read about who the columnists are, what do they write about, what do they do, um, what are their interest levels, what, do the, what, do the, what does the paper do, what do they write about. So when we're calling them, especially pitch media, we'll go, oh, you know, I saw your article the other day on the dog walk. That is really cool. You know, we represent this other firm that does this. Would you be interested in doing something like that? First of all, you've made a connection because you've read something. <laughs> and you can certainly do this online these days as well. Um, I'm just a old fashioned, I like to hold the newspaper in my hand still. Um, but I've made a connection with that individual. Um, suddenly they know that we're talking their same, having their same discussion and there's something they're interested in. So we work really hard in understanding the media. In this market, we're really fortunate. Um, not all markets have all the TV stations, radio and a newspaper or two in their backyard. We're really fortunate here. So use them to your advantage. Um, don't just watch the news to watch the news and see what the weather's gonna be for the day, but I'd highly recommend um, getting to know what um, they're up to, what their interest levels are. Um, other thing I would tell you about the media is um, if you want bad news to go out, put it out on Friday about one or two o'clock in the afternoon um, because it'll hit Friday afternoon online and it'll hit Saturday morning, which is the lowest read newspaper of the week. Um, if you want good news to go out, um, put it out on a Monday or a Tuesday because you'll have the whole week to talk about it and brag about it and share it with other people. And um, the other tip is for Sunday nights is the highest rated new TV news program um, uh, across the board because people, what are they doing? They're looking for the weather for the week, seeing they're kind of getting back into their, their scenario for the week ahead. So if you can do anything on a Saturday or even a Sunday would be better for it to run on Sunday night at 10 o'clock, you'll have your highest TV audience um, overall. I don't know. <laughs> oh, uh, make your news newsworthy. Um, we have a lot of people that come to us and like, we just want you to put, to put out a press release. And we're like, well, what do you want the goal to be? And like, oh, we want to we wanna just get the word out about us. And we're like, you know, that's fantastic. I think you can do with an uh, individual probably in your firm that could, in your organization could write this. You probably don't want to pay us for our services because we're going to push back on what we think is newsworthy. Um, make it relevant, make it timely. Um, Find activities and events that you can tie your organization around to. Probably you all do this already, but um, for example, one of the things we're doing right now is we work with um, Rockford Spine Center and it's National Scoliosis Month. I don't know if you knew that, but neither did I. 
until the other day. Until my team member told me that they're doing a national sc scoliosis event and they're doing some activities in town and suddenly we're calling the media and we're saying it's National Scoliosis Month. Here are the top 10 things of how families can be aware of it, how they can detect it, how they can protect from it, and how they can manage it if they do have scoliosis. So find angles, tips that makes your organization relevant if you're an insurance company. A lot of issues with tornadoes and hurricane season is coming up, although we won't be affected by it up here. But do you have enough tornado coverage? What does that look like? How does that affect your, your home and your family? Do you have enough? And what should you be, when are you overinsured and when are you underinsured? Good topic right now because people are talking like crazy about the tornadoes and the bad weather that's going on. Flooding's another one. Sponsor in unique ways. I think this, oh, there we go, it flips. Sometimes my team puts these together and I don't. Um, so, fine, you know, you, you, we all get these calls, right? Like, we want you to sponsor something. I'm like, oh, what's my benefit? What do I get out of it for, you know, the $1,000 or $2,500? Like, you get your name on a banner. And I'm like, that's fantastic. What else do I get out of this? Find ways to be really creative. For example, if you're, I'll throw out a couple ideas, and you've probably um, thought of these for your own company if you're being asked to sponsor a run. Um, you know, in addition to your name on the T-shirt, ask how many names are going to be on the t-shirt because if there's 25 names on the t-shirt you lose all value of what your sponsorship is um, but if, you, if that's one of the benefits that's great so what can you put in the goodie bag can you put um, can you have is the event near a place that you can set up a booth or can they run to and from your location for example um, is there a place that they can you can pull them into your business again it goes back to know your audience if runners or people that fall into the demographics of runners or healthy people do not feel, fit into your audience type, then pass and find another way. Um, I hate to say this, but we get calls every year from the schools to sponsor um, you know, football programs or whatever, and that's fantastic. It's not my audience. Um, and we'll look for other things to help sponsor schools or um, area, you know, whether giving money to help sponsor something, but we're not gonna put something in a program for a school, um, school district program. It's not my audience. It might be your audience. Partner with other organizations is another idea. Um, one, it keeps the cost in check because you're sharing the cost. Um, and two, usually better ideas come together if you can share it. Um, one of the examples, this was several years ago, um, when now it's a brio. Whoops. Now it's a brio. Um, it used to be Bacchus. Um, and we wanted to get people to know that there was, um, and now there is a little bit more nightlife downtown, but um, there was some nightlife downtown, and so all three of these organizations came together, Bacchus, Carlisle Brewing Company, and Kryptonite, to do a billboard. This was actually a billboard that was on the east side of town and said um, something like, you're going the wrong way, come back this way, there's nightlife in downtown, state in downtown. And we tried to capture that there was, there was dinner, there was drinks, and there was something fun to do afterwards, some live music. One, the cost just got divided by three for a billboard. Uh, two, um, the newspaper thought it was a great idea, so they picked up the story as well, so we got the whole billboard in the newspaper, too. So it was kind of a win-win a across the board. Uh, but look at your vendors. Um, look at people you collaborate with. Look with people with outside your industry that might be something of interest for your organization. Um, if you look at a lot of newspapers or magazines these days, you'll see, we scan them to see if there's any good companies we should be partnering with or looking at not only from a business standpoint, but from outside standpoint too, and for that reason alone, because is there something that can team up, we can team up one of our clients with, or can we team up with to do a bigger, better job on what, whatever we're choosing to do? You can't get out of any presentation without talking about social media, so we'll do the social media number in eight. Um, be social, um, find a way, every organization has a benefit for being in social media, but I'll tell you one big thing is if, if you start it, you need to have dedicated people to it because there's nothing worse than saying you have a Facebook page, you have a Twitter page, you have a YouTube page, um, you have a Pinterest page, and you put a couple things up there and one of two things happen, and we all know this because we've seen it. Either one, um, you start it and you maybe make a couple posts and then the next post comes two months later, the next post comes another month later or three weeks later, or you have an event and suddenly it's like you threw up on Facebook. and. You have like, have you seen that, right? Where everybody has like, oh, there's 12 pictures. We had an event. This is exciting. Um, versus like maybe stringing them out over the course of a couple weeks. Um, so find ways to be social and use social media for your organization. Some things to consider. Um, 
enable conversation. Don't just post to post. Don't just say we are the greatest company ever um, and here's who we are. Um, we work with uh, GFS Marketplace um, around the country and they, um, they do a great job of doing social media because they'll ask questions like, hey, it's National Chocolate Day. Don't you wish every day was National Chocolate Day? <laughs> okay, I'm back. Um, so, you know, what's your favorite chocolate candy? It, you know, and people were posting it, enabled conversation. Suddenly people are thinking about things and talking about things that all we had to do is post one question. Um, you know, it's National Peanut Butter Day. Do you like chunky or smooth? Do you like organic? Do you like smooth? You know, what kind of peanut butter do you like? I think we had like 400 people post that day on what kind of peanut butter they liked. Um, so enable a conversation. Don't just push it out there. Influence the conversation as well. Realize that you can't control it. I know that's the number one thing when we work with clients on social media. They'll be like, oh, you know, we don't want people to say negative things about us. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to do this. We don't let them say negative things about you because I bet you they're going to say them about you if you're not there. So let them say them online so you can respond to them. Um, we've had a couple instances where somebody has said, oh, I had this issue with this, this company or this product and it allowed the organization to come back and go, thank you so much for telling us you had this issue. Um, either one of two things we do, if it's a critical issue, we'll go back and we'll say um, something like, if you, if you don't mind, we'll contact you directly and get this resolved for you. Or here's something you can do next time or we'll send you a coupon or you know whatever we can do. But suddenly what happens, everybody that that person was complaining to saw a resolution or a response. So you can't control it, but you can influence in a positive way. Um, also, social media is really good for informal, non-costly um, uh, focus groups. So it might be like, hey, uh, we worked with a cookie company. Uh, here is, we're doing this new packaging for cookies. What do you think about this? And we got several responses and some of them were fantastic because one of the people said, this sounds like something I would say, don't give me like a long sleeve of cookies because what's gonna happen? I'm going to eat all those cookies, but rather give me, package them in smaller amounts, like three to five cookies and we'd like that better because then I don't feel so guilty. I'll take three to five to work or I'll eat them and I don't have to open up the whole bag and they developed um, different cookie sleeve size based on that response. So find ways to interact, ask questions. Um, I'll go back to a landscaping or a lawn company because it seems to be an, an easy one to talk about. You know, what is the worst part of mowing your lawn? Is it the trimming? Is it the mowing? Is it going around the bricks? Is it um, keeping everything the same shape? You know, able conversations and then influence it. And influence does equal economic viable opportunities for your company too. It does not always turn over into revenue tomorrow. But if you can help a conversation, um, you can help influence it. You've taken people from informing them of like you have cookies uh, to that you have them in smaller packaging that might be more beneficial for them versus the large packaging to, oh my gosh, they're at my local grocery store. I could go pick them up next week type of thing. So suddenly, it could be economically viable if that works for you, but sometimes it's just persuading, telling them about your company, but in a way that's enabling the conversation. Number nine, become a thought leader. Um, I know that most of us hear this thrown a lot, around a lot, and um, some people feel like they are thought leaders, but they don't seem to be out there a lot, and some people um, may not think that they're thought leaders, but let me tell you this, if you're in a company that does something, you're a thought leader, you just have to figure out how to tell people about it. So if you're an insurance company, your company may be around for 100 years. Fantastic, you know what? That provides you credibility. You've been through how many depressions and recessions. Um, you're now a thought leader of how companies or individuals get through horrible times when crisis, whether it be a man-made crisis or other crisis, comes to your hometown. Um, so suddenly you can talk about that. If you're doing lawn, we'll go back to that one, how do you talk about what, you know, how do you best do your lawn so it takes the least amount of time? Um, when do you um, make sure that you're fertilizing? I have no idea actually. But, but how do you know when to fertilize the lawn? How do you know when to put the plants out? How do you know um, when to bring the plants in? Things like that. Make, them a, make the, you a source for uh, your key audiences of getting information from you because I think that'll go a long way because even if maybe they're working with a competitor and you give them a piece of advice, um, they might look at you again next time. So if they're getting information from you instead of their current company that they're working with, that should tell you something. 
and that would be a, a big persuader um, for me at least. We worked with a, um, we were working with a bank at one point, or we were a, a client of a bank, and um, they not the best bank in the world, and they weren't here, so it's not a local bank. Um, but I went to set up another meeting with another bank, and you know what they did? They had printed out my website at the time. They had given me a bunch of information. They said, hey, we represent other companies in this area. Here's three more ideas. The choice for me to make that change was so quick because they took the time to even know about me um, and print out information. So they were a thought leader because they're like, oh, we saw this in the paper, and then this happened, and what about this? And it was hugely beneficial for them to just be aware of who I was and who the company was. And number 10, <laughs> be creative. Um, this comes in so many forms. I, I like to say there is a golden rule for this, but um, we do a lot of brainstorming in our office. In fact, I know we have one this afternoon with a, a current client that we're working on because they've done a campaign um, every fall and it's kind of gotten a little old and they're like, well, we just want you to pretend like that campaign doesn't even exist and start over from scratch for us and tell us what we should be talking about in the um, September through November timeframe. And we're like, okay, this is gonna be fun. So uh, we sit around and eat cookies um, and are very creative, but we try to come up with ideas um, that are outside the box. Um, love this, outside the box or a paradigm shift. Um, but here's a couple ideas that have come up. Kids cook up a cookbook. This was uh, in the Houston Chronicle. This was several years ago. But um, we worked with March of Dimes. Yes, March of Dimes, ba saving babies, right? right okay. <laughs> um, they wanted to team up. Uh, well, actually, it started, I should say it started out with Riviana Foods, which is a rice company. So they do Mahatma Rice and Success Rice. You see them in the grocery stores. And they wanted to do something fun because their number one market, surprise, are busy mothers. So that's why Success Rice is so, um, is so popular because it's 10 minute uh, boil in a bag. It was one of the first ones at the time that came out. So they wanted to get uh, into busy moms, um, and they thought how they do it is going through kids, but you can't just send out an ad and do something just to reach busy moms. So what they did is teamed up with March of Dimes, and this is another partnership opportunity. Um, they called March of Dimes and they said, let's do a cookbook together focused on kids, and we'll sell it, and the proceeds will go to March of Dimes around the country. So it started out with an um, a open call to any families and kids that wanted to send in recipes that had have rice in them, ta-da. And, um, and then they narrowed it down. I think we had about 350 recipes that came in overall and narrowed it down to the top 25. And then what we did is we brought kids from Houston, Texas into the Riviana Foods test kitchen and tested the uh, top recipes. And this was a fun idea, so who showed up? Good Morning America. And they, did a, uh, they talked to the kids about what they were making and why it was easy. And certainly the client's name came up all the time about Riviana Foods and how they're a good supporter of um, March of Dimes, but also they have this great cookbook. Cookbook came out, there it is. I can't remember what it was called anymore. Kids Recipes for Success, the Success Rice. So um, it was hugely popular and March of Dimes made a good amount of money um, without having to raise a sponsorship or do anything other than just have a lot of fun with the kids. This was another one um, we did here in Rockford. It was. 2003, um, I don't remember if you remember this, but Carlisle Brewing was fairly new in town. We were doing work with them. And one of their most popular um, beers was the, um, oh my gosh, help me out guys. I'm so old. <laughs> the Scottish Ale, the Scottish Ale, thank you. Um, and so what goes with Scottish Ale? I think of Scotland, we thought of, thank you. So we got four media celebrities in town to bare their legs and um, interestingly enough, they all said yes right away. And so we said, um, here's what you're gonna do. Um, we want you to bury your legs. The newspaper was all in it because one of their columnists was burying his legs. And um, you had to vote on which legs were the best. Um, I think most of their moms voted 100 times, but <laughs> they did a good job. Um, then what we did is each, um, each uh, celebrity then uh, waited, uh, was a waiter uh, at the um, Carlo Brewing one night for a charity of their choice. So I think somebody represented Cancer Society, one represented the Heart Association, so they, they chose different ones. And for every, um, they made all their own tips and their tips went to that organization. So some of the organizations made up to $1,000, some were 250, just depended. But 
Aaron Wilson was one of those people, and you don't think he wore his T-shirt that said Carlisle Brewing and come out and see me Tuesday night at the Carlisle Brewing because all the tips go to my charity of choice. Um, and then that Friday night, we brought all the men back together, had them do a strut on the bar, and um, they got money again, and all that money went back to their, their best charity. So it was a fun week. Um, it was creative versus putting out a press release saying, hey, the Scottish Ale is out again. This kind of got people interested, and I would say it was, it was a, definitely a packed crowd that night as well. And that was a long time ago, because I don't think all these people are still on the air. We had, we had Mark Bonney, who's no longer with the newspaper, Aaron Wilson. There was a person from TVO, and we're missing one other person. I forget who it was. So, top 10 tips. Take a step back, understand your goals, and know your audience. Customize your organization for your customers, and not for your competitors' customers. Um, but who are your lowest hanging fruit? Get creative and have a lot of fun questions that I can answer, or I can make up answers to. So. 